Amen. All right, let's get in the world. We are still looking at the In Christ Realities season number three. In Christ Realities season number three. And we've been examining the subject of Brother Paul's revelation of identification. We've been looking at the uniqueness of the Pauline theology and it's been an exciting time of studying the word of his grace. Second Peter chapter 3 verse number 15. Second Peter chapter 3 verse number 15. Brother Peter writes concerning Brother Paul's writings and letters and ministry and he said an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So we began to say that brother Peter gives credence to the insight, the sophia, the wisdom, the insight that brother Paul had when it has to do with the teachings of the Old Testament. He had a unique insight, a unique insight or a unique revelation of what was written in the Old Testament concerning the Christ. So we said Paul therefore is a skillful expositor of the words of Jesus and of the life of Jesus. We also established that the Pauline theology is not a contradiction of what Jesus taught. Also, Jesus' theology is not a contradiction of what Moses taught because Jesus' theology was Moses' theology. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus taught beginning at Moses and all the prophets. That was his theology. And then brother Paul also explained the Old Testament with a unique insight on what we call the doctrine of Christ. Because everything Jesus said and everything brother Paul said were found in the Old Testament books. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1. Let's examine a few things from the Pauline writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse number 1. Not chapter 5, chapter 15 verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Next verse. By which also you are saved. By which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Next verse. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. I'd like you to take note of that word, according to the scriptures. So then brother Paul starts another issue by saying there are some people who have come among them in Corinth who claims that there's no resurrection of the dead. So he said, look, if I have told you Jesus rose from the dead and you are going to be raised with him and then someone tells you otherwise, why will you lay it to heart unless you had believed in vain or unless... You believe that what I told you wasn't true. He wasn't saying if you don't keep the word in your heart, you will lose salvation. He was just saying you must take what I say serious because it is validated in the scriptures. And don't be tossed to and fro and blown away by every wind of doctrine. He's talking about stability in your understanding of the message of the scriptures. Look at that verse 3 again of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Next verse. And that he was buried. And that he rose again according to the scriptures. 
So he brings in what he saw from the scriptures as authentic. He brings in what he saw from the scriptures as evidenced by the twelve. Please pay attention. When he uses the word according to the scriptures, he borrows from Jesus' hermeneutics in Luke 24, 25. Luke 24, 25 to 27. When he rose from the dead and he was instructing the disciples. He said unto them, O fools, according and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And you know, Brother Paul says this so often. That you must not lose out on what he says. So he begins to say, according to the scriptures, Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again. So what does, what does in the spirit of truth, or what he does, talking about brother Paul, in the spirit of truth is the resurrection or the revelation of the resurrection. That is what the Pauline theology communicates to us in the spirit of truth. The resurrection of Jesus is the crux, the heart of the Pauline revelation. So in Romans chapter 16 verse 25, brother Paul begins to say Romans 16 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Next verse. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith. So he calls what he writes the saying of the prophets. The word prophets in verse 26 is the word propheticon in the Greek. Propheticon. That is the scriptures of the prophets or the words of the prophets. Which is the same thing Peter will say. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. The words of the prophets in the Pauline writings, and Peter calls it a more sure word of prophecy in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. We have a more sure word. Knowing this first. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Then Romans, brother Paul in Romans 16.25 calls it the charisma. Romans 16.25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel... And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world begun. Next verse. But now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. By the scriptures of the prophets. The charisma. According to the revelation of the mystery. Or according to the apocalypsis of the musterion. The apocalypsis of the scriptures. The question is, where did Paul get it from? Well, remember, Jesus in Matthew chapter 13 verse 11. And also Mark and Luke. They say unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Please stay with me. Unto you... It is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. All right now. So there is the musterion of the kingdom. So Jesus used the word musterion. What does he call the mystery of the kingdom? He calls things in the Old Testament the mystery 
of the kingdom. Things in the Old Testament. And Paul is saying, I am writing the same thing to you. So brother Paul again gets that from Jesus. He says again in Romans chapter 16 verse 25. Put it up for me. Romans chapter 16 verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. The word secret there is key. The word secret is the word sigao. Sigao. S-I-G-A-O. Sigao. Kept secret. Sigao is used for a relative silence. A relative silence. Let's see different places where it is used. Because the word sigao doesn't mean absolute quiet. Mm -mm. Look at Luke chapter 9 verse 36. Luke Chapter 9, verse 36, the word Sigao. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close. Or they kept it secret. And told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. That means what they had seen, they didn't tell others. It was not absolute silence. Some people saw, but it was kept within a circle. The word Sigao. Look at Luke chapter 18 verse 39. Luke chapter 18 verse number 39. And they which kept, which went before, rebuked him. That he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. This is not absolute quiet. So silence there means, reduce your voice. Don't make it loud. Look at Luke chapter 20, verse 26. Luke chapter 20, verse number 26. And they could not take hold of his words before the people. And they marveled at his answer and held their peace. Not that they stopped talking altogether. And it's not an act of being dumb. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 12. Who is on that computer? You need to walk with me. Acts chapter 15, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. Desiring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. The multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. Relative silence. Look at Acts chapter 12 verse 17. Acts chapter 12 verse 17. But he beckoning unto them with their hand to hold their peace and declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. So it's not dumb, dumb, dumbness. Now look at how brother Paul will apply, apply the word cigar. 1 Corinthians 14.28 1 Corinthians 14.28 But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. But let him speak to himself and to God. So it's not absolute silence. Neither is it dumbness. It's a tone. Look at that 1 Corinthians 14 verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 30. If anything be revealed to another that seated by, let the first hold his peace. Let the first hold his peace. So it's not stop talking. Look at verse 34 of 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. So it's relative silence. The, the word sigao in Romans 16, 25, 26 kept secret since the world began. It's relative silence. In other words, it's not as it should be loud. But what God has done is what they were not loud on. 
what God had done is what they were not allowed on. It was kept secret. But he has revealed it by Jesus. And no doubt Paul is talking about a gentile salvation. Which Paul now gives much details. So Paul is talking about details here. And not absolute silence. Details. That's why in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 to 4. Romans chapter 1 verse 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Next verse. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now that is where brother Paul talks about his gospel being about Jesus in the flesh. He wasn't present when Jesus was in the flesh. So how will the gospel now in verse 3, Paul saying he was made the son of David according to the flesh. How did Paul get that? Because Paul and Jesus never met for once in the flesh. Now he will leverage on what Peter and John and the 12 eyewitnesses said. The beauty is in verse 14. He said Jesus is marked out the son of God. Romans 1, 4, sorry. 1, 4. The beauty is in verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. He is marked the son of God. Now that's the spirit of truth. That's the allos paracletos. That's the revelation of God in precise details. And so Paul takes it on. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. By whom we have received grace. That is apostleship. The word and there is kai. TKS rule. That is apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So he says this is the reason why I have a ministry. He has received grace. That is apostleship. Because if all that Jesus died and rose and went to where we could, we could not see him, if that is what happened, then Paul wouldn't have a ministry. The ministry of Paul is post-resurrection. How that Christ rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of majesty. So Paul said because of his resurrection, because he rose from the dead, I have received grace. That is apostleship. Let me read it for you properly. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Next verse. By whom we have received grace. So Paul he said because of the resurrection he has received grace that is apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So brother Paul is saying his experience is vital. That now explains that experience. In Romans 1.5 he says I didn't receive ministry, grace, and apostleship by eyewitness. I received ministry by the resurrection of Christ. I received grace and apostleship. I received obedience to the faith. So therefore, Brother Paul will close this book in chapter 16 of Romans by saying, This faith 
that he has received is to explain in details that which wasn't said much, that which was kept secret since the world began. What is that adventure or glorious adventure of Jesus? So the book of Romans becomes Paul's argument on that revelation. The book of Romans. That is the Pauline argument on the revelation that was kept secret since the world began. Look at his words in Romans, the first four chapters. Brother Paul brings an argument. He begins from Genesis. And he takes their mind to the gospel of God. The gospel of God since the world began. That's how you open the book of Romans. Then he talks about Abraham. He quotes what everybody knew about Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith. That was brother Paul's crux of argument. That was the heart of the argument of brother Paul. From Genesis, how that Abraham was justified by faith. Then brother Paul now asks, why was he justified? Was he circumcised? Paul said, no, he was not circumcised. So circumcision is out. He must have been circumcised in the heart. Not the outward circumcision of the body. And that was the point of brother Paul. That is why he is now called the father of those who believed. Abraham is called the father of those who believe. If you listen to Paul and you were a theologian of that day, and you listen to Paul, you should get angry. You should get angry if you're a theologian of that day. Then he now begins to say to them, what did David call the blessedness? Abraham was not even a Jew. Abraham was blessed. He was declared righteous and he is without sin. Then when he's done with Abraham in his argument in the book of Romans, he now says, therefore, he is done with foundation. He begins to put on the foundation building blocks. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith like Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He brings to power the way Abraham's body, who was physically dead and unable to conceive a child. And now that because an example, how that becomes an example of that justification. Then brother Paul points God's justification. How that he raised Jesus from the dead. And this is brother Paul's 100% legitimate argument. You have to deny Abraham to deny Jesus. You have to deny Abraham to deny Jesus. That's how he ropes them in. He now says the vital work is this. We have access to this grace. How? God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then brother Paul says, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed forth into our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So he begins to explain the details in our lives. The work of righteousness is in our hearts. He mentions the spirit in our hearts. The word heutesia, Romans chapter 8 verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Then he goes to verse 8 to 16, where he emphasizes the indwelling of that spirit. That that spirit that has made me free from sin and death now is in us. That's the vital work. He points that out very strongly. In Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, 5, 6, 7, 8 chapters of Romans, he jumps out of his crowd 
and begins to talk about his brethren, the Jews, in Romans chapter 9. You know, I believe that Brother Paul must have had relatives that were not saved because of the passion with which he, he spoke about his people. Then Romans chapter 12, he comes back again and talks about the spirit through us. So look at this. Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. The first four chapters of Romans, the spirit to us. He talks about the spirit to us. Then Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. He talks about the spirit to in us. First four chapters, the spirit to us. Second four chapters, the spirit in us. Then it jumps out of the narrative and it talks about the Jews in Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. Then it comes back in chapter 12 of Romans into the previous discourse where he says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. I've already told you you know that the word holy and acceptable which is your reasonable service is talking about God's service to you and God's service in you. God's service to you and God's service in you. Now, it is time for God's service among you. God's service for you, in you. It's now time for God's service among you. Then he begins to talk about the church. In Romans chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. All about how we relate. Because you see, in all of the parables of Jesus on the kingdom, there's always activity. What's the activity? He now says, we demonstrate what Jesus has done for us among ourselves. This is Paul's ecclesiology. What Jesus has done for us, how we exercise it, among ourselves. You know, you can't teach soteriology without a sota. You can't teach soteriology without a kingdom. And you cannot teach soteriology without a people that he conquered through him. So he now says, you demonstrate that kingdom amongst yourselves. That's why he comes up with a discourse about food. Some of you believe that food is not supposed to be eaten. Some of you believe that food is supposed to be eaten. Then he says, don't judge him who does not believe that food should be eaten that is sacrificed to idols. He said, don't judge him. That's ecclesiology brother Paul is introducing. Then he says, righteousness Peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, that is the kingdom of God. Keep that somewhere. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, that is the kingdom of God. Keep that somewhere. <clears throat> the kingdom of God, he says, is not meat and drink. You know, I have told you about, you know, earlier... Romans 2.29 is not of the letter, but of the spirit. So, righteousness, peace, and joy, thus the kingdom. Then brother Paul says, he that served God in these things is acceptable. Then he closes the Roman account with chapter 15. When he talked about the church in Rome, how that the church in Rome should give to the church in Jerusalem. So Romans chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15 is brother Paul's theology on ecclesiology. Ecclesiology. Which is the essence of Paul's letters to the church. Ecclesiology. So he closes that by talking about what they should now be doing among themselves. 
So if I was, if it was about heaven, leaving the earth, then there will be no kingdom. If you are just supposed to be born again, die and go to heaven, then there will be no kingdom concept. Kingdom is here. Jesus is that kingdom. Jesus came with that kingdom. When we got born again, we are born into that kingdom. So we now have the kingdom of God. We now live in the kingdom of God. Then he says, you know what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Renew your mind. Be transformed. That he may be able to acknowledge what is that good and perfect will of God. You know, the grace of God works in you. If you teach, if you show mercy, if you show love, and you prophesy. You help those in need. You help the weak. Then brother Paul talks about you pay your taxes. It's quite alright. Show love to others. Romans chapter 13 to 15. Then in chapter 15 he now says, those who are weak, you receive and help. Then he now says, brethren, pray for us. This is an overview of brother Paul's strongest argument. In the book of Romans. How we ought now to relate among ourselves in the midst of the world. Now we have a background. The background on which brother Paul will teach all of these activities. That background is that Jesus the light of the world in the midst of darkness. Now we are in the midst of darkness. You know, he told those guys, I send you a sheep, sheep in the midst of wolves. Be as wise as serpents, as gentle as doves. He said it to them, but for this age, we are in. We are to be gentle among ourselves and in the world. The church now becomes the expression of the person of Jesus in the midst of the world. You know, brother, brother Paul's most intelligent piece is the book of Romans. And people get always struck at how he lays that foundation very, very accurately. He is explaining the Christ that died. He died because that is his character. His death mirrors his life. His life is in the four gospels. He died because that is his character. So his character mirrors his life. And the life of Jesus will be seen in the four gospels. That's why the death of Jesus is both a sacrifice for sins and an example for living. The death of Jesus is both a sacrifice for sin and an example for living. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse 17. Romans chapter 6 verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. The word form of doctrine is the Greek word hupon didache. Hu hypon didache. That is a way of explaining the Old Testament. That's why brother Paul will warn if somebody comes and doesn't teach it this way, mark him and stay away from him. Mark him. Anyone that is not teaching this form of doctrine. He said that person is not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But he is serving his belly. <laughs> Why will Paul say that? Because what Paul taught was consistent with what the apostles taught. You know I tell people whatever promises Jesus didn't give in his letters. Whatever promises, please listen carefully, 
I tell ministers of the gospel, whatever promises Jesus didn't give in his letters, whatever promises the apostles didn't give in their letters, don't try and look for it. Don't try to preach it. Just say what they said. Teach what they taught. Christianity is apostolic and historic. What was handed down to us. Don't be giving people promises in 2022 that Jesus never gave when he was on earth. Don't coin false hope. Deceptive coinage of things that are high sounding that the apostles never promised anybody the apostles never promised anybody about some you know unique things that will happen in 2022 the word of god has eternal realities for all time and all generation just like paul he is faithful he said that person that tries to say what jesus never said that tries to give promises that the apostles never gave, is serving his own belly. So Paul has very strong ecclesiastical or ecclesiology. Ecclesiology simply means the study of gatherings or the study of coming together. I mean, look at how brother Paul explains the rapture or what we call the resurrection. He explains it ecclesiastic, ecclesiological, that is a coming together, an ecclesia, a gathering. Just like in salvation, God and man are united. In the resurrection is a unity of those that are united with God physically. The resurrection is not a disappearance. It's a gathering. A unity of those that are united with God physically. It's also a church gathering. It is the way those who are dead will come together with those who are alive. Salvation, therefore, cannot be taught outside ecclesiology. Because it is a coming together. And Paul taught it both ways. What we receive in Christ. What will happen because of what we receive in Christ. You know you are born into a family. Let me give you some statistics. The use of the word church. Jesus uses it three times. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 to 19. I will build my ecclesia. That is, I will call those whom I will call to be with me in the resurrection. I will build my ecclesia. Then two chapters after, he now talks about relationship. In chapter 16, I will build my church. In chapter 18, he now talks about relationship. If your brother offends you, go to him. If he doesn't hear you, take two or three people with you. If he doesn't hear you, report to the ecclesia. If he will not hear the ecclesia, the body of believers, then just treat him like an unbeliever. Matthew 16, salvation, I will build my church. Matthew 18, ecclesiology. Your brother who offends you and he refuses to make settlement with you, take him to the ecclesia. Let's see the book of Acts. The word church is used 18 times. And it's for physical gathering. Ecclesia. Those that are called out. Only Paul uses the word ecclesia 46 times. Because Jesus taught salvation as ecclesia. He taught Christian living as ecclesia. And Paul uses the word 46 times. 
in 1 Corinthians, he uses it 16 times. You know, you cannot teach ecclesiology without Corinthians. Because Corinthians is really how we are. Corinthians is really how we are. In Ephesians as well, ministry gifts as well, which is our gathering. Because you can't have ecclesia without service. The word diconia. You can't have ecclesia without diconia or service. Because the reason for our ecclesia is diconia. We are serving one another. The word Ephesians church is nine times in the book of Ephesians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I mean in 1 Corinthians alone, the word church in 1 Corinthians alone, 16 times. When you come together. The writer of Hebrews also uses the word ecclesia. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2. I mean ch chapter 2 verse 12. Hebrews 2 12. Put it up for me. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12. Saying. I will declare thy name. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? Wow. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 23. Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. To the spirits of just men made perfect. In James, James 5, 14, he talks about sin for the elders of the church. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, 13, he talks about the church. All of this is for your private study. You will see the word church once in the book of John. Then in 3 John, you will see it three times in third John. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the word church appears seven times. Then churches in plural. Different assemblage. In Acts of the Apostles, the word church appears four times. Paul uses the word church 20 times. 20 times. So brother Paul was also a promoter of Christian gatherings in many places. In the book of Corinth, it is used 14 times. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, talking about churches, is used 12 times. So you can't have the polar revelation without ecclesiology. You can't have the Pauline revelation without ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is how we interact. Ecclesiology is what we do. You can't be saved to yourself. We are saved into a family. And so Paul leverages on what Jesus said. Jesus rose from the dead. He met Mary Magdalene. And sees who sees him as a gardener. The first day of the week, <laughs> she thought he was a gardener. Brother John's good imagery. Jesus sends her against all Jewish tradition to go tell his apostles. So the first person who was who told them Jesus rose from the dead was a woman. So a woman was the first sent out one, the first apostle to the apostles. And he says, go tell my brethren, I go to my father, your father. Family language. My father, your father. So brother Paul got that word family. We are family from Jesus. 
In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. The word Adelphos. It means we relate with someone. We relate with someone when we come from the same womb. Someone we came with from the same womb. Adelphos. And the womb is the resurrection. We were raised together with Christ. That is the womb where all of us came from. And that is the spirit of truth. So brother Paul having Genesis in mind takes us back. He says in this family we are not called after male or female. There's no bond. There's no free. There's no male. There's no female. He is taking that from Moses' words. Male and female created he them. That verbiage Moses used in Genesis 1, 26 to 28 was the verbiage of the church. Because Moses' image in Genesis 1, when he talks about light in 1 and 2, then sun and moon on the third day, so there's light before sun and moon. Then he talks about let us make man. Let us make man. And you know Pilate was not wrong when he called Jesus this man, the man. And we are all found in that humanity. Soteriology. Where all of us are found in one man, the Christ. So when you hear, according to the scriptures, what the scriptures have said about this man, the man in Isaiah, the man in Jeremiah, the man that Abel knew, the man that Enoch knew, the man that Noah knew, the man Abraham saw on Mount Moriah. So Paul's Passover becomes Jesus because everything is centered on Christ. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, where Paul talked about according to the scriptures, you now put it side by side with Luke 24, 25 to 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, scriptures, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 45. Then opened it their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So there was a man. Hallelujah. There was a man all through Genesis to Malachi. And this man was Jesus. So brother Paul's Passover is Christ's example of sacrifice. Jesus chose the night of the Passover, not the night of the atonement to die. Why? Because Passover has ecclesiology. Moses told them, you take the lamb to your family. You will share it among yourselves during the Passover. Family, Passover. Jesus said the same thing. The Passover is Christ's family. We are one bread. The Passover is Christ's family. What comes out of it is Christ's family. When you eat and deny brethren or maltreat the brethren, you eat damnation. There's so much of Christ in Paul's letter, so much, that you will wonder, what did this Paul really know? I mean, look at a little survey, Paul and Christ. The word Christ doesn't feature so much in the four Gospels. Because Christ is an explanation of Jesus. And in the entire four Gospels, the word Christ is used 60 times. In the book of Acts, it is used 31 times, the word Christ. In the book of Hebrews, 13 times. In the book of James, 2 times. In the book of First to Third John, 14 times. In Jude, 5 times. The word Christ is used 11 times in Revelation. 
in first and second Peter 28 times. So all through, all through non-polite letters, the word Christ is used 74 times. Four gospels. Now remember the four gospels has re repetitions in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yet it is used 40 times. Just Romans alone, the word Christ is used 67 times. All of Paul's letters has the word Christ 360 to 370 times. So Paul wrote more about Jesus than anybody else. In Romans, 67 times. So Paul's letters were heavenly about Christ. Why? He has a Sophia and insight in the teaching of Christ. The advanced teaching of Christ. What about the word Jesus? The word Jesus. Four Gospels has the word Jesus 600 times. Yet it has Christ 60 times. In Acts of the Apostles, Jesus 69 times. However, in all the other epistles, Jesus is used 52 times. Paul letters alone, the word Jesus is used 222 times. So Paul talks heavily, heavily on Jesus. Heavily on the Christ. Then the word Lord. Lord. Paul uses the word Lord 269 times. The writer of Hebrews has it 17 times. James 15. Peter 21. 2 John 1. Jude 7. The word Lord. Revelation 22, making all of them 84 times. Paul alone uses the word Lord in the epistles 269 times. He uses Jesus in the book of Acts 94 times. Four Gospels, 108. So, Paul explains the lordship of Christ more than anybody else. He explains Christ more, Jesus more, Lord more. He is being the Christos, the Messiah, the Sota, used more by Paul. So those things weigh heavily on their writings. So Paul explains that post-resurrection, Reality. What Jesus calls the pneuma aletia, spirit of truth. He said, in that day, John 14, 20. In that day, put it up for me, John 14, 20. At that day, you shall know that I am in my father. And you in me. And I in you. You will know. Which means everybody wrote their commentaries from the resurrection. Peter will start from the resurrection of Jesus. Brother Paul, I mean brother John, will call it the fellowship of his son. James calls himself the servant of the Lord Jesus. The same thing as Jude. Brother Paul never added anything. All he did was to explain further. More verbiage, more expressions, more vocabulary of what Jesus taught from what Moses taught. What will you find in his letters? Advanced explanation of everything Jesus said about himself and the church. Brother Paul is a custodian of the advanced explanation of all that Jesus taught about himself and about the church. So there is a consistency in the Pauline theology which is an advancement of Jesus' theology 
taken from Moses' theology. Don't forget, you cannot have soteriology without ecclesiology. The reason for salvation is family. The reason for salvation is a gathering. So that's why in Brother Paul's letters, he puts up a case for soteriology as ecclesiology. He talks about our gathering. He talks about our assemblage. How we treat one another. How we look after one another. How we relate with one another. He took time to do some work in those parameters. So brother Paul, in Romans 16, 25 and 26 again, before we begin to pray tonight, Romans 16, 25 and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the apocalypse of the mysterium, which was kept secret since the world began. Sigao. But now that which was not loud since the world began is now made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Glory to God. Glory to God. So, as we continue to explore, you will see the consistency of theology. You will see the emphasis of the Pauline teachings, which is the foundation of the New Testament. That's why Paul will say, I, Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the apostolic foundation. But let every man take heed how he builds upon. So, when we zero in on the Pauline teachings, we are bringing you to a place where you are rooted and grounded in the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. Glory to God. Glory to God. I tell you, friends, we're going to have an exciting time tomorrow morning as I continue teaching along these parameters. You don't want to miss tomorrow because we're going to explore some riches. It is going to be an adventure in the truth. First service, 8 a.m. GMT plus one live. Second service, 11 a.m. GMT plus one. I'm going to bring you some serious word tomorrow. And I'm excited about it. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. That's all we've got for tonight. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this building online, on television, in the house centers and campuses all over the world. Revelation knowledge grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. Barriers are terminated. Obstacles are destroyed. A decree that you grow in grace, you grow in knowledge and abound in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. As we begin this evening to pray, I declare that as we pray, light shines. You know what to do. You walk in the plan. You walk in the purpose. You walk in the pursuits of God for your life. And in the name of Jesus, I declare that clearly you receive instructions and directions by the Holy Ghost. Great grace is upon you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Glory to God. Grab your offerings, everybody. Grab your offerings. And I like you quickly grab your offerings. And when you grab your offerings, those online, the banking details are scrolling. Those on television, the banking details are scrolling on television, on, on radio. Mr. Michael Bush, when, we, when in Acts, the counselor will read the banking details for you. But on all other platforms, Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, all of you, prayer continues right now. And all the house churches and campuses, we join in the prayers. It's only on radio, we're going to have Acts the counselor now. Tomorrow is going to be partnership service. Tomorrow we're going to have our partnership service, both in the first and second service. All partners of this ministry, we love you and we thank God for your consistency and obedience to the spirit of God and to the assignment that God has given to us to blanket the earth with the gospel of Christ. It's going to be partnership tomorrow, both first and second service. We love you guys.
Lift up your offerings. Let's pray. Father, we give in faith. We give with joy. Our offerings are a sweet smell. What a joy. What an opportunity to advance the cause of Christ on the earth through our givings. Thank you, Father, that our offering is a sweet smell tonight. And we rejoice for the opportunity we have to continue to advance your cause. And we are excited that we are a pleasure to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You don't want to go away, radio audience. We're going to go into the other studio with Mr. Michael Bush for Ask the Counselor Now. How Centers Campus, his online community, television, and all of you on social media. We're going to join the prayer right now and begin to pray and look forward to greetings. Remember, at 